Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this episode, you'll meet data journalist Elliot Morris. He's a U.S. correspondent for The Economist. His new book, his first, is titled Strength in Numbers. We'll talk about the history of public opinion polling in the United States, the development and use of polling, and why he believes polls are an essential element in our democracy. We'll also discuss the accuracy of polls today and the often criticized predictions made by forecasters during the 2016 and 2020 presidential elections. G. Elliott Morris, pollster and data journalist, your new book, your first, is titled Strength in Numbers, How Polls Work and Why We Need Them. I was struck by that title because it actually reflects your philosophy about polls. So strength in numbers, why do you think polls really play an important role in our society? Well, that is, I guess, the question of the book. You know, when I set out to write it, I started from this statistical perspective, I guess not to correct the record, not a pollster but just a reporter on the polls. I don't do any myself. Um, And when you consume a lot of political polling information, as I have, you start to notice that they get things wrong uh, quite frequently, actually. Um, The average of polls is what we like to focus on um, when we're forecasting elections. Uh, But what's even more important than that is uh, what pollsters ask about people, what they want from their government, what they want their leaders to pay attention to, the problems they want them to solve. And so... While we have a plethora of political polling information before elections, and they sometimes get things wrong, um, the issue polls are actually pretty accurate. And so in this book, I I wanted to ask, well, what can we make of that data, of the issue polling data, not to forecast an election, not to try to predict who's going to be the next president, but to try to increase the representation for the average American and, you know, give the people an extra fighting chance in their democracy. So your title is data journalist for The Economist. So explain your beat and how long has there been a specialty like this? Well, the data journalism team at The Economist, I think it was created before I got there in 2018. I think they created it in 2014. Um, And I guess if my beat is the aggregation of political polling information and trying to figure out what what the people think or what they want, uh, in a statistical way, that hasn't necessarily existed more than, I'd say, two, two decades. So some of the first political polling aggregates came out before the 2000 and 1996 elections, at least those that we have access to re- readily. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's a pretty limited time span. And, and one thing you notice when you cover the polls um, is that there's, you know, there's lots of uncertainty in what we know about the world. Um, and the statistical aggregation of the polls uh, really speaks to to that uncertainty. Um, and, and I guess the question I have to ask in my day-to-day is, uh, are these polls that we're observing today, are they showing real movement in the electorate? What can we know from one given poll about what the people want? Or um, is that, you know, are, is this statistical noise? Um, and, and that's a pretty recent phenomenon. What's the background or training for a data journalist? Well, I, I went to school for political science, and actually not, not really statistics um, at all, although I have some statistical training in my coursework. Uh, I mean, I'm young, so I graduated pretty recently, so lots of that stuff's pretty fresh in my mind still. Um, but I think you can take any road you want to get there. I mean, some of my colleagues were PhDs in political science. Some of them uh, were in the health industry in the UK before they became uh, data journalists. And lots of them were just, I guess, regular journalists or conventional journalists uh, that got really interested in Microsoft Excel. <laughs> so now, now they're data journalists as well. So first book? First book, yes. And what was it like writing it? Uh, it was very rewarding, actually. So uh, at The Economist, most of our articles are, are pretty short. You know, 800 words, a long article is 1,000 or 1,500. So this book is about 70 times as long. Uh, to be able to go into something uh, with, with as much depth as the book was a lot more rewarding for me than um, the, you, know, you can go a lot deeper. You can ask a lot more questions about, about the book or about the, the subject of the book. Um, and, and it was great. There's, there's lots of really great stories in the book that would require more articles, at least two or three to tell, and so to be able to tell those and um, to bring that information out to the people uh, was a really nice experience. So we're going to start on your subject matter, as you do in your introduction, with the two last presidential elections, because they're fresh in people's minds and how the pollsters got it so wrong. Let's watch the compilation of pundits after the fact talking about the polls in those last two elections. How could the polls have missed this so badly? 
Oh, there is going to be an incredible, long, deep, rigorous autopsy done on the polling that pervaded this campaign. How did the polls miss this? Because people uh, voted in much larger numbers for Donald Trump in the rural areas than anyone expected. The polls got the popular vote nearly right, but missed badly on how the states were going to fall in terms of the electoral vote. The Trafalgar Group is again predicting a Trump victory, even though most other reputable pollsters predict a Biden victory. If a broken clock is right twice a day, then uh, you got to consider... We've been right so many times that, that uh, it's, a much, it's a group of different broken clocks, apparently. Tune into American TV news in recent months, and you might be left with the impression that Joe Biden was on course for a landslide. These phony national polls were shoved down our throats. Biden is up by 10. Biden's up by 12. Biden's up by 15. Do you know when I took over as campaign manager in 2016, we did zero. Let me repeat the number. Zero national polls. So, Elliot Morris, how did the industry get it wrong twice? Well, I'll say, first and foremost, I understand the, I guess, frustration or maybe anger at pollsters. If you're a Hillary Clinton voter in 2016 and the polls, or at least as they're relayed to you, say she's going to win with a 99% or 80 or 70% probability of victory, and then she doesn't win, I would find that thing to blame, too. Similarly, if you're a Donald Trump supporter and the polls are always saying there are more liberals than there are conservatives or more Joe Biden voters than there are Trump voters, I would feel angry that this is like rigged against me personally. The one thing to remember is that when we have a statistical poll, when we, when we have a poll, it's only a survey of maybe a thousand people on average. And, you know, they do some fancy math and we'll talk about that to make sure those represent the, the population um, as a whole. But it's in those statistical tricks and the science of sampling um, where you, pollsters arrive at some estimate of what the population believes. Maybe it's 45 percent for Hillary Clinton. Maybe it's like 10 percent of people like Diet Coke and 5 percent like Pepsi or something. Um, and those estimates are uh, reliant on a few assumptions that pollsters make about statistics, about people. Um, and those assumptions can go wrong over time. So in particular in the 2016 election, when pollsters field a survey, they assume that Democrats and Republicans are going to respond equally. This is kind of hard to correct for, whereas pollsters can weight their samples. They can do some statistical tricks to make sure there's the right number of white or black voters or high income or low income voters in their samples. It's almost impossible to have a correct estimate um, of the number of Democrats and Republicans. And so if those groups aren't answering your polls, uh, uh, if, if one group is differentially non-responding, that's the technical term to, to your poll, um, and they're a partisan group, it's almost impossible to correct for that 100% of the time. And so that's what you see in 2016 is Republicans really not picking up the phone. And <clears throat> was that intentional? Was there a concerted effort or is it is it uh, due to other reasons that pollsters now understand? Well, <laughs> this is a really hard question to answer. One, it's just because social science is hard, uh, but the other is the way that we would answer this question is uh, by using a poll. But if these people aren't taking the poll, then you don't know if they're lying sure. to you. They can't tell you uh, they're lying to you. Now, the evidence on uh, people lying to pollsters, what we might call shy Trump voters, um, is pretty thin. Uh, there are some uh, the, the, there's some social science surveys that try to weight samples differently for whether or not you trust the government or not to try to have a balanced sample based on whether or not uh, people trust the government or their neighbors, and they don't find any differences uh, in support for Trump. Uh, I'd say it's still an open question. We don't have a final answer to it, but most of the evidence so far suggests people aren't so lying. So is the real challenge trying to do this on a national level? when you're looking at something like a presidential race? Or should people really learn to look at key states and see the polls of that a smaller population size? Well, one of my friends in the clip, Anthony Salvanto, would tell you uh, you should pretty much disregard, at least in national elections, uh, the national polls. You should pay attention to the aggregate of polls in the state, or uh, you should take a national poll and, again, do some fancy statistical tricks to try to get uh, an estimate of, of what the people want in every state. I, at least as long as the United States has an electoral college, I'd say, yeah, you, you want to ag aggregate the polls in every state. The national polls can tell you something. First off, there's lots of them, so uh, if there's any you know, shifting winds uh, in the public, the national polls will probably pick that up first. Uh, but as far as trying to infer where the states lie from the national polls, that's 
uh, s sort of missing the mark. So you're, you have message in your, in your book for three audiences, the pollsters, the media that report it, and the public. So your message for pollsters in this book is what? The message for pollsters is uh, to be a bit more honest about what they're doing. Now, pollsters, of course, if you bring them on a C-SPAN or you take them to the media, you give them an extended interview, will typically tell you um, that they're making estimates, that they can get things wrong, that um, you shouldn't trust polls 100% of the time or with 100% accuracy, and that there's a margin of error in their numbers that uh, states how wrong they could be according to some laws of statistical sampling. But those messages don't really come through in their reports. When you read a news report on a poll and there's an interview with a pollster, it's usually just about the results. And maybe that's a bit on the reporter's side. So the suggestions there are to do their own due diligence with how much they should trust polls in their own reporting. Right? If they know from the past two elections that polls can be wrong, then they should forefront that information for the public. They should remind them, hey, there's a margin of error here. Maybe it's 5 or 10 percent, whatever it is. And then they should give the story as if that's a scientific estimate, not some true fact uh, about the public. Would you <clears throat> spend a minute on margin of error and explain what it is? The margin of error is a <clears throat> statistical term for uh, how wrong an estimate in a poll can be 95% of the time. So this goes back to sampling, as I was telling you earlier. Um, if you pick up 1,000 Americans out of some bag of 350 million, you are going to get some weird Americans X percent of the time. And uh, the margin of error will tell you, you know, there's a 5% chance that uh, a candidate's going to win if they have a 53% uh, support in the poll, for example, if there's a 3% margin of error. Um, and they calculate that based off of the what's called sampling error in the poll. Again, it's that, that sampling out of the bag of Americans. But there's other things that can make polls go wrong, too. Uh, there's weighting adjustments, again, whether or not they have the right share of Democrats or Republicans in their poll, whether or not they're using recent estimates from the census for the share of white or black Americans, what have you. Um, and then, you know, there's the tendency for some groups to not respond. And then there's measurement error in the polls, too, whether or not they're asking good questions. And so, you know, while we have this great tool, the margin of error, one thing to note is that it's not uh, always 100, you know, covering 100 percent of the probabilities there. So staying with that, anytime you report on polls, or anyone does in the media, if you scroll to the bottom of the article, there's always very small print, the margin of error. What's an acceptable margin of error? Well, first off, I think they should put that at the top. We shouldn't have to go all the way down to you know, realize that it's an estimate. Um, an acceptable margin of error, I guess, is whatever, whatever the sample tells you. you know, if there's 1,000 people and your margin of error is 3%, that's typically um, what it is. Um, then you should just accept that information and know, you know, the percent of Americans who like Coca-Cola could be off 3% uh, or, or whatever. Um, you, you, of course, don't want to, to listen to a, an estimate that has a margin of error of 20 percentage points, but I mean, most polls are more accurate uh, than that. Um, you probably want to be pretty careful with the population in your poll, with a sample size um, of, of around you know, 400 people or so. Those Those polls can change pretty wildly between survey. Okay, let's go back to the three groups. So that's the pollsters. So your message for the media is what? Right, highlight that uncertainty. If, if we know that the polls uh, can be wrong, as, as we do from the past two elections, and then they can clearly be more honest with the public uh, when they're reporting these numbers. So um, websites like 538 now owned by ABC News, I think that's a pretty good acquisition for ABC News to uh, have some election forecasters sort of under their umbrella, that's a more honest discussion of the error uh, inherent in political polling and statistical sampling uh, and asking the people what they want. Uh, there's, of course, other pollsters at other news outlets, right? Uh, Anthony Salvanto at CBS. Uh, there's plenty of pollsters at CNN also or NBC. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of the other journalists that we have to be careful with um, who may not be as trained in surveys as the ones who are employed you know, to run surveys for, for major media organizations. Um, th they should be honest when they're discussing these numbers. Uh, I think they should sort of read the evidence, maybe read the book <laughs> on polling. Um, and I think they'd give a better uh, indication to, to consumers of the news and to the public about how, you know, prone to error polls can be. And what's the message for the public? The message for the public is, right, to take whatever the polls say, take it with the appropriate size grain of salt. Um, you know, in 2020, for example, the election forecasters were saying 
hey, Biden is up eight, but, you know, the average size error in in recent uh, presidential elections mean he could maybe win by one or two, and that might not be enough to carry those key electoral college states that, as we know, were, were pretty close in the end. Anyway, um, and, and, you know, if, rep- if reporters uh, are reporting on those numbers, honestly, I think that information gets to the public, but uh, they shouldn't have to rely on, on, on the press to get this right. Um, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book also. Today on our program, we had uh, Larry Sabato uh, f- from the University of Virginia, a well-known, long time working in this field. And he made the standard statement, which is at the end, which is the ultimate poll is always in the voting booth. <laughs> what is it about the irresistibility of pre-election polling that the media continues year after year, election year after election year, to return to them? I think there's an innate human desire to want to know the future, but, but there's also, of course, the desire to want to know who's going to run the country. I mean, the stakes for politics are really high now. There's some stories in the book, though, of straw polls being used in the 1824 election, so certainly nothing new. And, of course, you know, we've had elections before that in Rome and in Greece, also stories in the book. Now, of course, they weren't as you know egalitarian <laughs> as we have now. Um, uh, so if there's this desire to know who's going to run the country in the future, then the pre-election poll is is going to give you that information. Uh, they also serve as key benchmarks for how accurate polls on other questions can be. Again, the Coca-Cola question, or uh, on the you know percent of Americans who support abortion rights or gun control, or you know major issues uh, in our democracy today. And pre-election polls are sort of the key barometer of how accurate those polls are. Now they're not the only barometer. There's other information you can. Ask if uh, there. You can ask the percent of Americans who go on the internet or who own a refrigerator. These are key government statistics for the accuracy of their surveys, and you know, on those metrics, polls are pretty good too. Uh, but that's one reason, or there's a few reasons why you might want to take a pre-election poll. So uh, you say though that most pollsters work. The majority of their work is not so much in pre-election polls, but in issues related. So. What is the value of issues? You talk about uh, pollsters work in issues, and well, I'll see the three points and have you talk more about them. They reveal the will of the people. They are instrumental in a whole paragraph on this in shaping Supreme Court decisions, and I want to come back to you on that one after the Dobbs decision, and informs legislators sometimes constraining them about the views of the public when they're legislating. So would you speak more about those points? Well, those are some examples of how the issue polls, right? again, polls on what Americans want the government to focus on or specifically what they want them to do. So examples of how those data get used um, by by the government. And, of course, we don't just have these anecdotal uh, answers. One thing I try to do in the book is rely on the hard statistical social science, political science evidence on these things. And what you find is that leaders are pretty responsive when you give them a poll uh, about what people want in their district. So uh, there's a a couple of examples. There's one story out of New Mexico after a budget surplus uh, in 2008 or 2010, um, which finds that uh, after some political scientists gave, you know, sent letters to lawmakers about the public opinion in their districts, they were more likely to vote with the public opinion. And of course, we have plenty of anecdotes of, uh, especially, you, you know, there's there's one congressman in the 60s who says, you know, I'm here to represent the people. Give me as much information as possible uh, on what they want, and, and I'll represent them. Um, so if we have this evidence that says you know, the, the public is able to steer the ship of government and also people are listening to the public, then why not use public opinion polls in those areas where people aren't getting what they want to sort of push the government in the right direction? Um, and that's one of the original ideas uh, from one of the founders of polls, George Gallup, I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, for why this was a valuable instrument in taking the so-called pulse of democracy. Um, and you know, the book is just trying to trying to elevate the, elevate this idea beyond the electoral horse race. You want to say a word or two more about the Supreme Court reference that you wrote about? <laughs> right. And so there's um, there's evidence from the Supreme Court's uh, decision um, uh, before Oberg- Obergefell versus Hodges, which legalizes gay marriage in 2015. Um, and after the legalization of Roe versus Wade, uh, or the, the court's decision in Roe versus Wade to legalize abortion in, in the 70s, or at least um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's retelling of this, in which she says uh, she wants to be careful legalizing gay marriage because she thinks there is a backlash in the public opinion polls after abortion. So she wants to make sure the public is in the right place um, b- before 
they legalize gay marriage. That's after the California vote to um, legalize in 2000, uh, or it, it, the late aughts. Um, and um, and then in the Obergefell versus Hodges decision, Justice Roberts makes key references to public opinion polls also um, in deciding both to take up the case and in uh, the direction of uh of the public in moving towards more uh, rights for same-sex couples. Um, and, you know, again, this anecdotal evidence, but uh, you're never going to get a quantifiable <laughs> study out of the Supreme Court that says this is moving the needle. Uh, I guess if we can push around the edges, that's uh, s- sort of enough if we have the other evidence. So much of your book is on the history of polling, which you made reference to. And I was, uh, noted that you, you described the story of public opinion polls as enthralling. <laughs> um, as only a data journalist would consider. So let's jump in. You go back really far in history to the ancient Greeks and even earlier, but we're going to start with U.S. history and the 1824 election, of uh, which you referenced before, the first recorded occasion of straw polls. How did they come into American politics at the time? Well, I'm sure they existed before then. That's the earliest uh, known reported uh straw poll in a newspaper. It was dug up um, by a man named Emil Herja and then sent to George Gallup later in history in, in the 1900s. Um, and the reason we call them straw polls is because they're not statistical polls. They were polls or voice votes taken at military musters or at Fourth of July parades during the election, uh, both so leaders of those organizations could know what the people in the organizations thought, but also so newspaper reporters and editors um, could write both about what people think and honestly for their candidate. Lots of the times these straw polls are used essentially for propaganda by the newspapers who are, who are running them. Um, but it, these are the first real polls in America. You know, they're not great. You wouldn't want to go back to this method of sampling the people um, again. And they're almost exclusively about the electoral horse race as well. So we don't really have a great idea on, you know, the share of Americans or the voting population at the time, white male landowning Americans who support slavery or tariffs or whatever. Um, but but we do have some some great stories about uh, these first polls um, and you know what they may have told newspaper reporters at the time about about the people. Uh, noticeably, the Iowa parties still use straw polls in presidential preference early on in the contest today, and they are widely reported on. <laughs> Why do you think that is? knowing how statistically invalid they are. I think they're fun, right? You, you get to go to a county fair and you see people drop you know, corn kernels uh, and cut off plastic water bottles or what have you. Um, and you know, maybe there's some statistical properties. Maybe they're telling you about the people who go to the Iowa County Fair. I mean, they are, they are fun. Maybe, maybe we did polls originally because they were fun. Um, what we know now is that they're sort of more important than that. I, I don't advise people to listen to the straw polls in the Iowa County Fair if they're trying to figure out who's going to win Iowa. But uh, maybe if a reporter puts all of those caveats in their piece, then they can still write about the, <laughs> the county fair polls. You tell readers that straw polls began a dramatic change around the turn of the 20th century when newspapers really got involved. What happened? So people will know the story of the Literary Digest poll, which in, in the 1936 election predicted uh, that Alf Landon would defeat Franklin Roosevelt, fam- a famously bad prediction. It sort of w- we'll get there, uh, but there were straw polls long before then that were conducted systematically by newspapers. They were owned, um, they were done by the newspapers owned by the Hearst family. They were done in partnerships between newspapers, like in Ohio um, and Chicago, uh, and even you know as far as L.A. at the time, which sort of seemed maybe otherworldly from the East Coast poll takers. Um, and and these polls were more accurate. They uh, at least in the records we have of the surveys they were taking, they were more systematic. So instead of sampling a military muster or a Fourth of July parade, you had employees of the newspapers, or in the case of the Literary Digest magazines, go door to door or walk around town and ask people what they thought. You know, maybe they'd stand at a light post. You can just imagine a person, you know, a pollster with a big hat standing at a light post with a clipboard asking people, right, what, what they thought about the election or whatever. Um, and so it's because they're more systematic in the data collection and that we have more of them, so you can average them, that they seem a bit, a bit more statistically accurate. Again, it's not a scientific poll, um, uh, but, but it's the sort of rise of more uh, systematic data collection about what the people thought, at least before an election. So what's the famous Literary Digest story, 1936? 1936, the Literary Digest magazine uh, conducts... 
a nationwide poll of Americans. And the way they conducted their straw poll was that uh, they would send out um, their magazine with a square ballot on it that you could cut out and mail back. Um, or they would consult lists of telephone and automobile owners uh, who you know, they had addresses for, and they would send them a postcard and say, you know, check who you're going to vote for, Alf Landon or Franklin Roosevelt, um, and send it back to us. And so you have rooms full of ballots, millions of them from across the country at the Literary Digest headquarters, and they simply count them up. And they report that Franklin Roosevelt is going to lose by um, 12, 6 or 12 percentage points uh, to Alf Landon. And, of course, you know, they're like dramatically wrong. Their predictions are 38 percentage points off in the end. And to give 38? You, 38 percentage points off mm-hmm. on, on Roosevelt's margin of victory. To give you an idea, right, Joe Biden's polls, or the polls for Joe Biden in 2020 were off by four, four points. Um, so that speaks to the, the weakness of the straw polling method. And so, you know, what goes wrong is that the types of people who own telephones and automobiles turn out to be pretty different than the population of Americans at large at the time. You know, the people who don't own those things are poor. They might be more you know, likely to vote for New Deal politics, and so they support Franklin Roosevelt at higher numbers. And maybe if, uh, if you're more enthusiastic to vote for Landon, you're also more enthusiastic to answer the poll. And so some investigations of the poll after that have found uh, differential non-response, even in the Literary Digest poll almost 100 years ago. They went out of business in a few years later. Do you think this had something to do with that? Yes, yeah. It's a monumentally bad example of prediction in American history. Uh, they were doing pretty well also before before the prediction. Their revenue stream was fine. So uh, I would say, right, they went out of business because of a failed prediction. And Nin- there's other examples of this. 1936 later. was a year that one of the people whose company is still the biggest name, among the biggest names in polling, entered the scene, Gallup, George Gallup Sr. You know, we, we looked on YouTube and found one short clip of him, and I'm going to play that for us and just so our audience can see and hear oh, oh, what he looked and sounded like. Let's watch. In the uh, summer of 1922, when I was a junior at the University of Iowa, I was hired as an interviewer by the Darcy Agency in St. Louis. And they were working on the project uh, on a great survey of St. Louis for the St. Louis Globe Democrat. And I was an interviewer, and my assignment was to find out by going house to house, what uh, readers, uh, what newspapers people were taking and what they read in those newspapers, what they liked. I went back uh, to the University of Iowa with the resolve to uh, devise a better system. And uh, eventually that became my doctor's thesis, a a more uh, objective way of measuring reader interest. So what is George Gallup's contribution to the history of polling? I'm kind of frustrated because you just scooped me. That's the whole <laughs> introduction for Gallup in the book. Right, so he, he learns his first example of sampling, of how to figure out what people want from the RC agency. Um, and he develops this method for figuring out what newspaper articles people like, partly by asking them, by sitting them down and watching them flip open the newspaper and stopping and marking down what they read partly by picking up discarded newspapers and figuring out you know, wh- where people had stopped reading the discarded newspaper. Um, and he brings those tips uh, to advertising agencies after he graduates hit, you know, with this doctoral thesis on how to figure out what people want from their newspapermen, which obviously could sell more newspapers, um, to the advertising agency Young and Rubicam, uh, and where he's the director of research. He's essentially given a blank check and say, do whatever you want to figure out how to sell more products. Um, and he spent some time there, and then uh, in 1931, his mother-in-law runs for Secretary of State in Iowa, and he wonders, well, if it can work to, for toothpaste, why can't it work for politics? I mean, that's a direct quote. Um, and so he goes back home, and he runs some very primitive scientific polls, a bit more scientific, only a bit, than the straw polls, um, to figure out if she you know, has any steam, uh, what thing, what, what policy she might emphasize to get ahead in the race. And, you know, she wins. She becomes the Secretary of State in Iowa. And so that's our first, that is our first example of uh, electoral horse race, you know, scientific uh, 
poll. And it's important, I think, to note that it came from the same uh, instincts as the advertising man, just to figure out what people want and, I guess, to sell them something, in this case, a candidate. Um, George Gallup goes on. Of course, he founds the American Institute of Public Opinion Research in 1935. He does these polls in 1936, in which he predicts that the Literary Digest poll uh, will be uh, will miss the election, as they eventually do, and George Gallup's poll is more accurate, and so he becomes the sort of electoral savant of the day. Um, and he discovers along the way some really uh, incredible writing by a British-American statesman named James Bryce, uh, who says... Uh, you know, who writes treatises about public opinion in America, textbook links. I mean, they're used as textbooks uh, for, for a while in American history classes, um, uh, in which he says, you know, public opinion, if we would ever have a device to, measurement, to, to, to measure it, uh, could lead America into a fourth stage of its democracy, where the public opinion not only informed, informed leaders, but ruled itself. Um, and from that point on, and, you know, the early or the late 1930s, early 1940s, George Gallup is the sort of steward of polls as information for democracy, um, as something, again, that can tell tell leaders what the people want, and hopefully they'll do it, right? Um, his family's involved in progressive politics to sort of do, and, and I mean, like, lowercase p for electoral reform politics in the 1930s and 40s uh, to try uh, to, to have electoral systems that are more... Uh, reflective of the people's direct will. He's a big supporter of the New England town hall or like referendums in, in politics. Um, and, and ever since, polling has you know, been changed as a, as a tool for democracy, not just crude you know, snapshots uh, before elections, um, but George Gallup gives it this sort of democratic ethos. This is a good trivia question for our listeners to use on others. Who is the first president to have their own pollster? Franklin Roosevelt, yes. So, and who was that person, and how did he use them? <laughs> uh, so, Franklin Roosevelt uh, does not hire George Gallup as his pollster. George Gallup wants to conduct his own surveys. He's you know, making a fortune doing it himself. Why would he go into politics? So, George Gallup hires a little-known former miner and reporter from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I mean, he's from a town called Crystal Falls, which still only has a thousand people in it to this day named Emil Herja, who's the son of Finnish immigrants. Um, and Emil Herja is, you know, he, he is essentially George Gallup before there was George Gallup. But, you know, without, uh, I mean, you saw the way he was dressed, without the fancy dress and the hat and the, you know, democratic ethos about polling. Um, and uh, uh, um, and uh, so, so Franklin Roosevelt hires him in uh, his uh, 1932 congressional, or sorry, presidential election campaign uh, to run early polls of the Democratic Party's standing in congressional races, uh, of uh, counties in America uh, and of states that needed more resources from the Democratic Party to push Franklin Roosevelt over the finish line. Um, and Emil Herja has to build this all from scratch. I mean, I mentioned he's a miner. He's never done a poll before. He doesn't really know how to do this stuff. But because he's a miner, he knows about sampling. Because, you know, when, when you're mining, when you're hitting rocks, the idea is you hit some part of a wall in a mine or you hit a rock. And if there's ore there, then you focus on that area. So this is his speech to Roosevelt's director of, of the DNC at the time, a man named James Farley. So Farley brings him aboard. Um, and, and he conducts early political polls. And he takes polls from George Gallup, and he so-called adjusts or corrects them for whether or not they have too many Democrats or Republicans in them, but, you know, a problem we still have today, of course. Um, and he creates the first uh, tracking poll or trend line uh, of what the American people want. Um, and he leads the congressional Democrats to victory in the 1938 midterms. Um, and he continues to be uh, Franklin Roosevelt's pollster, public opinion confidant through the remainder of his first three terms um, in office. He, he leaves in 1937 because he doesn't like Franklin Roosevelt's court packing scheme. Um, but for those you know, seven-ish years when he's involved, uh, he is the powerhouse electoral targeter of the DNC. He is Franklin Roosevelt's uh, political savant called by, by the press the so-called wizard of Washington. I think he earned, he earned that name. 
to understand how big a deal he was at the time. In 1936, his cover, his face rather, was on the cover of Time magazine, uh, which we uh, can see here, and uh, a name that's very little known in Washington today, but what hugely important and well known at the time during the New Deal. Uh, I'm going to move to the 1950s because uh, the, the landline telephone became almost ubiquitous during the the 1950s and 1960s. How did that change polling? So, uh, so random sampling over the telephone was invented in the 1970s. Up until that point, the way you conducted a poll was you went door to door and you knocked on the door and you asked for someone at that house to tell you something about politics and Maybe you would record their demographic information. So, for example, George Gallup uh, could know if there are too many white or black or you know, non-college educated low-income voters in his sample or whatever and make the appropriate adjustments. Um, and, and this was a relatively scientific process after the 1948 debacle in which, of course, the polls predicted that you know, Dewey's going to defeat um, Truman. Uh, uh, George Gallup and the Social Science Research Council, which is this group of pollsters and political scientists, figure out how to make the door knocking more systematic. But it's expensive. You have to have a lot of people to go to all these doors. And there are some biases introduced along the way. If a white reporter, for example, doesn't want to go to a particularly black part of town or a neighborhood they feel is dangerous, um, then there's examples of those people not being interviewed in the polls at the time. And there are some direct stories of people feeling uncomfortable doing that. And so Random telephone polling is both cheaper, uh, invented in the 70s by a man named Warren Matosky, um, and and more accurate, um, and less susceptible to the biases of the interviewer. And so it's sort of the obvious successor to the more scientific, uh, what are called area sampling polls of the 50s and 60s. So uh, another technology that became hugely important to society, but particularly to polling in this conversation, 1960, John Kennedy, and uh, you write that he was the first to game out how various decisions might impact voter behavior, and we learn about the Simultec, Simultics? How do you say it? Simulmatics. Simulmatics Corporation, thank you, and the calculating machine that they use. Tell me that story. Simulmatics Corporation is the first micro-targeter in America. They... um, and, and but what I what I mean by that is they collected a lot of information from the polls, and not just the top line of the poll, but the actual interviewer records themselves from people like George Gallup, other pollsters like Elmo Roper and Archibald Crosley, and they put all this information in a computer, not the type of laptop that you and I have today, but the computers that could fill this entire room, um, and they they would ask it questions. They sort of gave it this, like, personality of its own, the computer, um, in which they were essentially figuring out if the Democrat, in this case, uh, Jack Kennedy's vote share, increased among some group by two or three percentage points, how does that impact the entire election? If he makes a play for Catholics, are there enough Catholics uh, to carry him across the finish line? What about the Northeast, et cetera? And so you can ask the computer for the first time the Simulmatics Corporation, I should say, cr- creates this uh, environment where you can ask the computer to run these calculations for you instead of trying to do it by hand. Um, and it's an immediate success. They pitched the idea to the Kennedy's campaign, um, to the DNC earlier, which isn't necessarily as interested, but give them some, um, some money to, to run some initial studies of his prospects. Um, and they're uh, eventually acquired by the New York Times to run electoral analysis, uh, live election night results in the 60s, um, uh, to see, uh, you know, if, if there's something here, if computers could lead the way, lead this sort of revolution in electoral handicapping. Um, so in this 1960 election, John Kennedy uses them specifically uh, to game out whether or not uh, speech in support of civil rights would help him win the election. Um, and they published that report. I, you know, I guess they're right because they debut on the stock market a few years later and are one of the richest corporations in America in a matter of weeks. You know, they would go on to lose almost all of that money and you know, declare bankruptcy, uh, but the intervening story of how they shaped American politics Um, It's the first example, basically, of mathematical political analysis. Well, here's an interesting uh, note that you say for your readers. After losing, Richard Nixon became a voracious consumer and constant commissioner of public opinion polls. 
How That's do we right. use them? Richard Nixon, I mean, I, I don't think you need polls to tell you this, was constantly concerned with his appearance. Um, uh, a, a chronic narcissist, at least in the way that he commissioned polls and absorbed them. Um, in the White House, at least, uh, he has this constant apparatus in the West Wing by his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, to get polls from other public pollsters, to do their own polls, and constantly assess his approval ratings. And so there's anecdotes in the White House. There's also some studies um, with interviews from people there at the time at, to see how did the White House use this public polling information. And, you know, the, the most striking stories are... If you, gave, if you gave Richard Nixon bad news, he would just sort of, like, shut the door and shut down. Um, and so constantly um, the, the White House was in search of something, some area where uh, the president was doing well or a policy area that they could focus on that was more popular than the president's sinking, sinking ratings, especially at the end uh, of his term in the White House. There, there are some of the Democratic questions we can ask about this. I mean, if the polls are being used systematically in the White House to elevate the you know, relevance or the salience of a certain policy, uh, does that affect whether or not it passes in Congress? If, sort of on the other hand, the president is continually figuring out where the public likes him and only focusing on those areas, are we missing the portrait of the man, I guess, you know, in 1969, the answer is probably yes. We didn't know a lot about what Richard Nixon would turn out to be, and maybe maybe the polls reveal that later on in his presidency. And then there's the great question of reflecting or leading in, in a democracy. Um, but uh, let, let me move on because we have just about less than 20 minutes in our conversation. And presuming uh, during the 70s and 80s, computer technology and the, uh, the telephone ubiquitous poll that people responded to uh, with greater participation levels than they, they do today, for sure. Mm. Um, let's fast forward to the 1990s, early 2000s. You referenced this technique earlier, and that's poll aggregation at first appeared. Why was that important? 1996 election is the first instance, at least in the American press, um, of someone averaging polls together. And this is important because um, if you have one single poll, it can be off for any variety of reasons. We've discussed some of those reasons, the sampling error, non-response. Um, but if you have two or three polls, your chance that they're all being biased in the same way um, is dramatically lower. And if you go from three to five to ten, ten polls or what have you... Um, and the chance that you are having a quality reading of what the American people want, I guess in terms of their leader or on a specific policy, is very high. At least that's the theory behind aggregation or ab polling averages. Now, in practice, we know that that's not entirely true, right? The past couple of elections, the averages have been wrong. So if people are systematically uh, less likely, one party, I guess, or one group of people, to answer a poll, they're probably also systematically less likely to answer all the other polls. And so aggregation is not a, a perfect technique for forecasting an election or figuring out you know, what, what people want, uh, but it is a large, you know, a revolutionary step in the right direction for controlling for the biases of any one poll. How important was political scientist Charles Franklin to this? Charles Franklin uh, is the first uh, public poll aggregators. He creates a website in 2004 called politicalarithmetic.com, later uh, contributes to pollster.com, which is a project between him, uh, another sort of polling pundit named Mark Blumenthal, who of course still writes about polls today, and Doug Rivers, who, um, you know, uh, who sort of funds their enterprise at first, uh, to put up the first website of polling aggregates. Um, they're particularly popular in their tracking of President Bush and then Biden's approval rate or Obama's approval rating. Um, and uh, they're some of the first averages for election forecasting. Also, of course, they have some competition at the time um, from uh, a, from Nate Silver, a man now famous for election aggr or polling aggregation. And he takes it one step further with election forecasting. So um, all this conversation you and I have been having about the uncertainty of the data can be quantified statistically, right? We would say if polls are on average over their history wrong, about three percentage of the uh, three percentage points, 
Um, they have a margin of error of six percentage points, therefore, and so you can do some statistical wizard wizardry to transform that into a probability of victory. That's some of what I do at my day job at The Economist. Um, and uh, that takes this sort of public consumption of the polls, both those two steps, aggregation and forecasting, to a whole nother level. Right? On the one hand, it's more systematic. I think it's more honest about what the data are telling you, right? It's just a reading, not like the grand truth about what the people think. I mean, George Gallup really, really believed in his polls. I mean, when they were wrong, he said, we did something wrong. This wasn't random. We have to figure out what we did wrong so we can be perfect next time. Because to him, the stakes were huge. It was the future of democracy, not just predicting an election. And I think I would agree with him there. Um, but, but at least if you're trying to forecast an election, you, you, don't, you don't want one poll. You want like 20 or hundreds. Um, and, and that's sort of the environment we're in today. But on the other hand, it might give people a false impression of how accurate polls and forecasts can be. Right? If you're telling people after the election that you were right in 49 or 50 of 50 states, that might make them sort of disregard that margin of error and, and think of your model or you as sort of the, like, you as the ground truth rather than the, the polls being estimates themselves. Speaking of day jobs, what was Nate Silver's day job before he got into politics? Oh, he was into baseball statistics. So um, he, you know, he, well, I don't know how much of this is literally insider baseball or not, but you know, he, he comes up with this algorithm called Pakota, which um, could forecast a baseball player's future success. And so that aggregation of baseball statistics obviously sort of informs what you could do with political polling data. Now, at the time, when he, when he creates 538 in 2000, March of 2008. He'd been blogging on you know, progressive websites, daily costs earlier, um, to come up with forecasts of whether or not you know, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama would win a primary, what the polls said about their chances in a general election. Um, all of that sort of comes from the same place, that if you aggregate information together, if you study the patterns and past data of how they predict the future, then you can come up with you know, pretty reliable predictions of the future. I, I think that's right, also, for what it's worth. How much did the media rely on Nate Silver's predictions in 2016? Uh, I would say not enough. Um, there, there were other forecasters, of course, who gave Hillary Clinton a 99 or 98 percent probability of victory. There were people in the press who sort of wrote about 538's forecasts as putting their thumb on the scale, right, which, in hindsight, I think is, you know, a pretty, pretty wrong article to write, is also factually wrong at the time. Um, uh, I, I do wonder, uh, so Nate Silver at the time is predicting um, that Donald Trump has a 30% chance of, of victory in the 2016 election, not because national polls are going to be wrong, but because the race is close in key states. Uh, I, I do wonder if every person in the media had sort of understood that 30% as a 30% as meaning, you know, these polls, if you, you've had three elections, three, they're, they're going to be wrong one time, right? And if your sample size is like 18 elections, then you have a pretty good chance that the polls are going to miss enough that, a, that the losing presidential candidate could end up winning. Um, I, I wonder how the, the tone of the campaign would have been different um, and what, what the people would have thought would happen. We have Nate Silver in February of 2016 on the importance of models. The good thing about building a system model is that it commits you to rules, right? So instead of just kind of saying, well, um, well, early polls aren't very predictive, and your prior is that Trump probably won't win, therefore probably not. Well, it kind of pins you down and says, well, okay, early polls aren't predictive, but at one point do they become more predictive? To have an a answer that is set up by an algorithm you designed ahead of time, I think is actually maybe more helpful than people, than people would think, right? So I guess kind of a long way of saying is that, you know, I'm not sure that I'm any better than the average pundit unless I have a model. And the disciplining effect of a model, um, doing your thinking in advance and setting up rules of evidence, I think is probably quite important. In your book, you credit Nate Silver with changing political reporting forever. And for the better, I think. Um, there's obviously some downstream effects to presenting forecasts as your very confident readings of the public. And, and there are also effects of creating data journalism in maybe places where there shouldn't be data journalism or creating a class of new news reporters who are overconfident about the polls or who only rely on the data journalism, right? Those are questions that are really hard 
to answer. Um, but if, if we're focusing on uh, whether or not people are consuming poles with the appropriate sized grains of salt, with uh, margins of error at the front of their mind, not just the back of their mind, I think the forecasts from 2008 through 2016, well, 2020, I guess now, um, are, are valuable and a step in the right direction. Yeah. So our next advance in technology is big data. How has big data changed polling? Well, big data is a bit counterintuitive with polling. On the one hand, polls are data, and they are big. So the sort of laws of sampling and statistics say if you have enough data, you're going to have an unbiased reading of the population. Um, obviously, that doesn't work for election forecasts, but doesn't work for polls. So um, with the rise of the Internet right in uh, the late 1990s and early 2000s, pollsters take their study of the public online, and they think, well, maybe we don't have to dial a thousand phone or ten thousand phone numbers. I guess today it's closer to a hundred thousand phone numbers to get a sample of nine hundred or a thousand Americans, and then to make our estimates off of that. Maybe we could compile lists of Americans and their information, and then ask them questions repeatedly over time. So these are called p- uh, panels or non-probability polling um, because they're not based in the laws of probability sampling, like previous polls. Um, And they are incredibly powerful. For one, they're even cheaper, uh, at least at the time, and they can be done almost instantaneously. So the first non-probability or panel polls uh, were conducted on on web TV set-top boxes that went on top of TVs. Uh, You know, that's like before my time. Um, And uh, and they would, you know, have little red lights that went on when uh, the web, you know, the, the polling company, this kind of Polymetrics, run by Doug Rivers, who we talked about earlier, uh, would send you a little red light if he wanted to, you to answer a question, and so you would sort of switch your channel to the set-top box, and you would like get out a keyboard or a remote, I, I guess, and certainly not a, a mouse, and you would answer the poll, and it would send it back through the TV, through the telephone lines, uh, to Polymetrics's um, headquarters, and they would conduct polls that way. So all of a sudden, you can conduct polls almost instantaneously. You can scale that practice to millions of people. Um, and so Doug Rivers is now the head of research at a pollster called YouGov, who I work with frequently. And now, you know, you don't log on to your internet from your set-top box. You go on your phone and you can conduct uh, political polls and answer them on, on your phone. Um, and you know, now they have three, five million people, I think, who can answer a poll any given day. And so the book sort of talks about how that practice actually happens. It is a departure from the traditional... Um, uh, the theories of how you should conduct political polling, but they're done pretty accurately. Um, and so you know, that, that's a, uh, another iteration in how polls are conducted, which makes them more accurate, um, at least over time, and solves some of the technological problems and societal problems that have led polls to be more susceptible to bias over time. Namely, no one's picking up the phone anymore. So you but have, you have to have internet or cell phone connection. You have to have internet, you have to have um, the time you have to know enough about politics to like want to take a survey for some amount of time voluntarily without someone calling you and asking you, which sort of creates some sort of obligation with that person. Um, and so they have to do even more fancy modeling and math than George Gallup or the internet pollsters between them had to do to get the right estimates. And so, on the one hand, you're making technological jumps forward. That is one theme throughout the book. But you're also making the job or the, I should say the job of sampling the people, asking what they want, is getting harder over time. And they have to keep, pollsters have to keep coming up with mathematical techniques to sort of cut corners and come up with good predictions. Our hours has sped by, so just kind of to wrap this all up, you uh, <clears throat> talked to pollster David Shore and told you that the challenges are deep and fundamental in polling, some of the things you just referenced, and uh, both methodology and communication continues to have to change. So as we wrap this all up, in the state of things right now, to have public confidence in the poll, to have uh, journalists feel that they're reporting accurate information, what needs to happen? The book talks about five suggestions. I'm not sure we have enough time for all five, but um, you know, the first one is that you shouldn't conduct a poll entirely via one method anymore. We have moved beyond only surveying people by mail or by the phone to um, by the web. Now we're in an environment, as of basically the last two or three years, where it's become very cheap and easy to combine polls 
from different methods. That way you're not exposed to these various technological problems of polling. So that's one suggestion for that's arises from from the political pollsters themselves. Um, another is for reporters to be more clear uh, when they're writing about polls, that they're estimates, they're not like God telling you what the American people want, right? We've discussed science and art in this hour, um, and, and, and I think pollsters should, or reporters should reflect that in their work. Um, and there are some other suggestions I put forward in the book. I think the official society of pollsters, the American Association for Public Opinion Research, um, should be clearer about the polls that they think are good or the polls that they think are ideologically biased or bad. And, they sh- and, and that serves as a useful signal to reporters as well um, in, in what they you know, what they should produce. Again, I think pollsters can be clear, too. I think we have time for this, because your fourth suggestion I want to hear more about, more political interest groups should devote themselves to measuring public opinion. Doesn't that bring bias into the process? I think it does. So the problem is when you only have one or two interest groups elevating the voice of the people. Um, If you have a lot of them from all corners of the ideological spectrum, um, then that bias, I guess, theoretically cancels itself out. But what I would say in response is that you, you know, we shouldn't listen to information from politically biased interest groups at all. So in this case, the recommendation is for uh, public polling interest groups or maybe even companies um, that, that conduct public opinion polls rather than advocacy, um, elevating the voice of the people, just conducting polls and saying what people want and relaying that information to uh, the people in charge. Um, but without the bias. Uh, would, the, would Pew research be an example of that kind? Pew, I would say, is a public pollster, not necessarily an interest group. I, I mean, w- w- what we see in the latter chapters of the book is that um, having some commitment to what the numerical majority of Americans are saying and sort of relentlessly championing that, I mean, obviously that's what George Gallup did, but we have interest groups today that do that. Uh, that's that's what the mission should be, rather than just conducting the poll, but really hammering home that lawmakers should listen to it. Um, I, I think, you know, it couldn't hurt to try. The book is called Strength in Numbers, How Polls Work and Why We Need Them. G. Elliott Morris is a data journalist for The Economist and the author of the book. Thanks for spending an hour with me. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 